Hi guys, welcome back. In a recent video I made this Heinkel HE111 and a few months ago I built this Spitfire and I said I was going to put these in a diorama and for once I've actually got around to doing that fairly soon after building the models. So in this video I'm going to show you how I built this Battle of Britain diorama. So the basic premise is we're going to have the HE111 whose engine is on fire being pursued by the Spitfire and that's going to take place over the English Channel with some cliffs in the background. So I've cut some XPS foam into approximately the right size and I put a little bit extra at the top there to represent those cliffs. Now obviously this is going to be a forced perspective diorama. The aircraft are 170 second scale. I obviously can't represent the cliffs in 170 second scale because they're 350 feet high. So instead I've made them quite small like this and I'll just force perspective. Now you can buy specialised stands for your aircraft, but partly because I'm locked down and partly because I'm a cheapskate, I'm just going to use some clear sprue. I took these from various kits, I think one is from the HE111 kit and one is from the 132nd Scout Lancaster kit. And the first thing I did was just try to get the aircraft in the kind of relative positions that I want. So this is roughly how I want them, something like this. And I've just pushed the clear sprue into the bottom of the Spitfire. Remember I left a hole when I built the model and then just loosely put that into the foam. Those clear sprues will be cleaned up later on. Now the 111 is a bit different because it's a much heavier aircraft and a single piece of sprue is not going to hold it up. Uh, it's going to have two problems. One is that the sprue is going to bend because of the weight and the other is that the aircraft is going to tilt because I can't quite get the sprue in the centre of mass. So a nice easy solution for that. I'm going to use a triangle of sprues at the front of the aircraft to take the weight and then just a third piece of sprue at the back just to keep the balance. I used a craft knife just to cut the cliffs into the approximate shapes that I wanted. These are going to get covered up so I'm not looking for precise detail, just a few inlets here and little crags and cracks there, a little bit of variation in the height, that kind of thing. And perhaps also a little, a few little bits of rock jutting out, that kind of thing as well. And even at this scale, which works out as approximately 1 to 5,000, I still want to have a little bit of variation in the height there, or it will look a bit unrealistic. And then PVA glue can be used to glue the XPS together. It's a good idea to put a few notches in the bottom just to increase the surface area and then usually put something heavy on top or pin the pieces together um, while they dry. And then this is the material I'm going to use to cover the cliffs. This is uh, AK's uh, ground texture. If you don't have access to products like this you could probably use uh, some tile grout or even some very fine sand, uh, even plaster of Paris perhaps. And I'm putting this on in a really thin layer, really trying to spread it out as much as I can, but obviously making sure all of the XPS foam is covered as well. The purpose of this is just to provide a basic texture for the cliffs. It's going to get painted later on. I probably should have put some uh, foam in this gap, but I forgot to do that, so I'm just going to slide some tissue paper in there just to fill it up and just use a little bit less uh, material as well. And the thinner the acrylic texture material goes on, the quicker it will dry. And at this scale, even tiny little bumps are going to represent quite large variations, so I do need to keep it quite smooth. So that's starting to take shape. Now normally when you're putting something like this down, spatula marks are best avoided, but I found here for the cliff faces, if I made vertical marks, they look quite good because they represent natural cracks in the rock face. And then I just put a few extra outlaying rocks as well. Now for water effects there are many different techniques that you can use, uh, there's specialised water products, you can use uh, resin, you can use aluminium foil to get the texture and so on. I've decided to go for a tissue paper technique, 
And basically the idea is that you soak the tissue paper in a 50-50 mix of water and PVA and then just gently work the waveforms into it. And even if you have tissue paper with patterns in it like this, it's really easy to remove those just by stippling the brush into the paper. Now the real cliffs of Dover are about 350 feet high, which is roughly 100 meters or 100,000 millimeters. Um, these cliffs here are only 20 millimeters high, so that gives us a scale of about one to 5,000. And therefore that means that even a one millimeter high wave in my tissue paper is going to represent a five meter wave uh, in real life. So I need to keep this fairly smooth. If you were using this technique on a larger scale diorama, you'd probably put more layers of tissue over the top, but I'm not going to do that because I want to try and keep it as thin as possible so I don't have those large waves. And what I've also done, which I probably should have done earlier, is just knock up a quick uh, wooden frame for this and then I filled in any gaps between the XPS foam and the, the wood. So for the cliff faces, the technique I've used is to paint them a fairly dark grey colour and then I've airbrushed over that with a lighter grey and I've also taken the opportunity to paint the top of the cliffs in a burnt umber colour. And so to take care of the ocean, I've got four acrylic paints, black, white, a bluey colour because I couldn't find a green and uh, burnt umber. And the idea is that I'll start with a kind of browny sandy colour near to the cliff base and that will gradually get darker and more blue, more green and more, more black um, as the water gets deeper. So you can see I'm putting the acrylic paints on here unthinned and although this is building up bands these are going to be blended later on, so these bands won't be visible. At the moment it looks a little bit like a, a rainbow drawn by a five-year-old. It will look a lot better than this later on. And then just getting some really dark, almost black water right towards the edge. Then I took a clean brush and some clean water and just started to blend the layers together. To be honest, I struggled a little bit here because I think the paint had started to dry and the tissue paper was a bit uh, absorbent as well, so it took a while. I think if I did this again, I would do a few bands of paint, blend them and then do a few more. But with some effort, I did manage to do it. In a couple of these places, I actually uh, brought the dark paint a bit further in, a bit closer to the shore. And I also brought the, uh, the water close to shore to get rid of some of the browny, sandy colours a little bit as well. And here's the final result, and I think they've blended quite nicely. These paints will dry matte, but I think for now they look quite good. And then moving on to the cliff face again while that paint dries, I basically just dry brushed in increasingly light colours. And in fact, I did a very heavy dry brush here, as you can see, with an almost white paint. I think in hindsight, it would have been better if I'd painted the cliffs a, a neutral grey, highlighted in white, and then maybe done a wash in black, rather than starting with a very dark um, cliff face. For the top of the cliffs, I'm going to use two products, a blended turf green from Woodland Scenics, and their fine turf burnt grass. And they're just in Ziploc bags because they go everywhere. So I've just got these two colours and I'm going to try to mix them into kind of a third middle shade as well. Obviously we don't want completely solid single colours, even at this scale it won't look very good. So to apply the scenic glue, normally what I do is I use a pipette to put some drops on and then just brush it into place and then just sprinkle the turf on top. It doesn't matter if it goes on too thickly because it, it won't stick and we can just flip the board over just to knock off the excess onto a sheet of newspaper or something and then collect it and use it again. And this is what it looks like after it's been tipped upside down. And so areas like this, which are low lying, often uh, collect water, so often the vegetation down there is greener, so I'm putting a few extra green bits there. 
and here's the final result. It looks quite good. There's a little bit of grass to knock off the border there and we need to do something else for the ocean. But before we do, let's have a quick look at the Spitfire. I can see this taking shape quite nicely now. This is the product I'm using to make the ocean look a little bit better. And I'm actually cutting this with about 25% water just to thin it down. I know you can get uh, thinner gels as well. I'm basically going over the entire ocean and then putting it a little bit thicker towards the coast, but still not too thick because we're still at this very, very, very small scale. And this will all dry clear. And then using a fine brush, just putting some right at the edge, partly to fill that gap in between the sea and the cliff base. And once the gloss coat was dry, I just drilled some holes in for the plastic stands for the aircraft. A few people made some really helpful suggestions on my HE111 video, uh, which I really appreciate, including the fact that I really need some kind of bullet holes and damage to the aircraft rather than just having the engine on fire. I really do appreciate your feedback on things like that, so thank you very much for those people who made constructive criticisms. A few people made some suggestions about using micro magnets to keep the bottom of the wing on, which is a great idea. As soon as this lockdown finishes, I'll be looking into that. I haven't made the propellers spin here, or I'll use discs to replace them. I'm not a huge fan of that effect, but I will look into that and alternatives in the future. And here is the final result. So I'm really pleased with the way this turned out. Uh, I think 170 second scale for the aircraft was a good choice. I don't think 148 scale would have worked well. Perhaps the HE 111 is a little bit too big anyway um, for this perspective. Perhaps it would have been better maybe to have a Spitfire chasing 109, but I'm still quite happy with the way it's turned out. Of course, the cliffs could have been made bigger and that would have changed the, the effect of forcing the perspective a little bit. But overall, I think for a quick diorama, a nice little base, I'm really happy with the way this turned out. So as always, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you enjoyed the video, please remember to hit the like button. With this lockdown, I'm getting quite a lot of work done at the moment. So hopefully I'll have a couple of new videos fairly soon. And the 132nd scale Lancaster is almost finished as well. So until next time, thank you and goodbye.